Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. I expected to have this interesting intellectual experience, and instead it was just completely visceral. Author and journalist David Barron talking about the first time he saw a total solar eclipse in 1998 in Aruba. It just tapped into something very, very deep in my in my brain. I mean, I, I really think even though I knew what was going on, the gut reaction was one of absolute horror and at the same time awe that it just sort of put my whole existence into a whole new perspective of appreciating just how powerless and puny I am, uh, but at the same time, just how marvelous and spectacular the universe is. And so it's both incredibly humbling and also incredibly empowering. I mean, it's this great paradox. Um, and that's, I think, what makes it so addictive and why why I chase eclipses and why there are other people who are eclipse junkies and why I think, frankly, after August 21st of this year, there will be thousands more people who will find themselves chasing eclipses all over the world. It's just an experience unlike anything else that you you just want to have again. David Barron will be in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, August 21st, to see his sixth total solar eclipse. You can hear my entire half-hour discussion with Barron, available on the Scientific American website as a Science Talk podcast. We also talk about his new book, American Eclipse, a nation's epic race to catch the shadow of the moon and win the glory of the world. It's about a scientifically and socially important eclipse back in 1878. If you can't make it to the Path of Totality on August 21st, check out the NASA website for live coverage, and then visit the Scientific American website for our post-eclipse wrap-up. If you will be in the Path of Totality, I wish you clear skies and a blown mind. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Take off your glasses! You've all taken off your glasses by now, along with the family and friends of my friend Dennis Meredith, because the great American eclipse of 2017 has come and gone, and most people in the path of totality, which the Merediths were in Sun Valley, Idaho, saw a terrific show. Now they have their memories, and batches of eclipse glasses cluttering up their homes. But don't throw them away, because many of the glasses are certified for safe use for up to three years, which is good news for people, especially kids, in South America and Asia who might not be able to afford or otherwise acquire new eclipse glasses. Those two regions will experience a total solar eclipse in 2019, and a California nonprofit called Astronomers Without Borders wants your old glasses to share with schools and those kids. Astronomers Without Borders has not yet announced an address to send the glasses, so hold on to them a bit longer and check back into their Facebook page or their website at www.astronomerswithoutborders.org. They request that you don't send the glasses directly to them, but to the various outlets they'll be announcing as clearinghouses for the specs. And while you're at their site, check out the other good things they do to bring astronomy to people all around the world. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. In the fight to conserve tropical rainforests, here's a tool you don't often hear about. Orange peels. Specifically, 12,000 tons of them dumped on the land. You don't normally associate waste disposal with biodiversity benefits, something that's good for the environment. Tim Truer is an ecologist at Princeton University, and he's talking about a unique conservation story. It started in the early 1990s, when an orange juice producer called Del Oro set up shop near the Guanacaste Conservation Area in Costa Rica. It's a region that contains several national parks and a wildlife refuge. Del Oro needed somewhere to dump their orange peels, and the company also owned forested land abutting the parkland that it had no intention of cultivating. So a deal was struck. 
If Del Oro donated its forested land, it could dump orange peel waste on degraded pasture land within the conservation area. A thousand dump trucks worth of orange peels were scattered on the land in 1998. And within about six months, the orange peels had been converted from orange peels into this kind of thick, black, loamy soil, kind of passing through this pretty gross stage in between of kind of sludgy stuff filled with uh, fly larvae. The results of that influx of nutrient-rich organic material? I couldn't even find the site the first time that I saw it. He couldn't find it because over 16 years, the orange peel waste had sent the land on a journey to become vine-choked jungle. Jungle with three times the diversity of tree species of the adjacent control plot, richer soil, and a much denser canopy. In other words, the experiment was a success. The results appear in the journal Restoration Ecology. Truer says perhaps this lesson could be applied elsewhere. It's really a shame that we live in a world where there's nutrient-limited degraded ecosystems and also nutrient-rich waste streams. And we'd like to kind of see those two things come together a little bit. You know, that's not licensed for, you know, any any agricultural company to just start dumping their waste products on protected areas. But it does, I think, mean that land managers, that restorationists, um, people involved with industrial scale agricultural operations should start thinking about ways to do thoughtful experimentation to see if in their particular system they can have similar win-win-win results. That's actually win-win-win. A win for the company, a win for the protected area, and because the jungle packs away CO2, it's a win for the planet, too. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. As the world's oceans heat up, salmon are migrating earlier. Plankton are shifting their range. But warmer water temperatures also mean warmer fish and faster running metabolisms. Fish that are in water of a higher temperature have a higher metabolic rate, meaning they have to consume more oxygen. Daniel Polly, a fisheries scientist at the University of British Columbia. Because essentially the whole metabolism, all the chemical reaction in your body are accelerated. So how about growing bigger gills to allow for more oxygen intake? Polly did the physiological math on that and concluded that bigger gills just won't do the job because he says gills, being relatively two-dimensional, simply can't keep up with the three-dimensional growth of the rest of a fish's body. Instead, Polly's calculations suggest that to feed their increasing need for oxygen, fish of all kinds may actually shrink as a result of climate change. With decreased supply, they'll need to lower demand. The study's in the journal Global Change Biology. One more detail bears mentioning, and that is that warmer water also holds less dissolved oxygen. So the the two effects, the increased demand and the lowered supply, are working toward making the fish smaller. Which means future fishermen might find a lot of lower-value small fry in their nets. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. When birds face the destruction of their habitat, some species don't make it, while others survive. But what happens at the very beginning of the process, just as the bird's habitat starts to change? Research in Argentina's Monte Desert has provided some answers. Protected parts of the desert have lots of plant diversity. Trees, tall shrubs, short shrubs, grasses, and flowering plants. With so many options, most seed-eating birds choose to focus on large grass seeds. The birds can get all the energy and nutrients they need with minimal effort. But when cattle show up to graze the desert's natural landscape, birds face changes in food availability. Some birds are happy to change their diets in response, but others not so much. And it's the ones set in their ways that are at the highest risk. Understanding how birds react to grazing can help conservationists figure out how to help those species most in jeopardy. Ecologists from the Argentine Arid Zones Research Institute compared soil samples from the desert's Niacunian Biosphere Reserve to samples from two neighboring cattle ranches. They discovered that grass seeds, the birds' favorites, were just one quarter as likely to be found in the ranches compared with the reserve. Next, they captured birds and flushed their digestive tracts to see what they were eating. The common diuca finch and the rufous-collared sparrow had adjusted their diets, opting to dine on their less preferred options at the ranches, even while they still focus on large grass seeds within the reserve. Meanwhile, the many-colored chaco finch 
and the ringed warbling finch were apparently unable to switch their foraging tactics. Even at the ranches, they worked hard to find the few grass seeds available. If they burn more energy foraging than they get from the few seeds they find, they could starve. At best, their dietary rigidity could limit their ability to reproduce or to care for their young. The results are in the journal The Condor. Studies like this can help predict which species are at higher risk in degraded habitats, and they can also help ranchers protect these vulnerable species, even while allowing their livestock to graze. For example, the ranchers can plant species for their cattle that will also be more palatable and nutritious for local seed-eating birds. The cows won't care about the menu change, but the birds sure will. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. 